Welcome everybody to the August Space Telescope Public Lecture Series. We have an exciting talk today on the importance of small objects exocomets uh, by Dr. Isabel Rebolito um, from the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, before we get into her presentation, I wanted to go over a few things here. So first, uh, who am I? <laughs> Your normal host is not here this month. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Brandon Lott, and I am uh, an astronomer in the Office of Public Outreach. I am colleagues with Frank Summers, who normally does this hosting job. But Frank is enjoying himself this month somewhere uh, in a secluded uh, place where he doesn't have secure internet. So I am uh, happily your host this month. Um, and we also, uh, of course, have coming back every month, our special thanks to our amazing tech team, uh, Thomas Marufu and Grant Justice, who are making sure that everything runs smoothly. All right, um, just some previews for upcoming public lecture series. In September, uh, we have a very provocative title, Astrology versus Astronomy. What's the difference really? Uh, by Nicole Arulanatham from the Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, she is a postdoctoral researcher here. In October, we have How Dark is Space by Todd Lauer from the NSF and Noir Lab. So I encourage you all to um, watch the next several public lecture series. As a reminder, you can find our uh, public lecture series on our website, the stsei.edu slash public lectures. Uh, if you go there, you'll find webcasts are on the left there. You'll see that you can find the webcasts um, the YouTube playlist, the webcast archive. Um, you can also sign up to get emails for announcements, lecture announcements on who is going to be um, presenting and, and so on. Uh, if you scroll down on that page, you'll notice that uh, we have listed the upcoming public lecture series, which I just mentioned to you all in the previous slide. Um, and so if you click on one, and so for, in fact, if you look, you also notice at the bottom, there's past lecture, public lecture series. So if you click on that past one from July, the Armchair Astrophysics Volume 2, and up pops up information on that public lecture, you'll notice that you can access the public lecture after this date via the STSCI webcast um, at the top or via YouTube at the bottom. And again, if you want to get more information, you can sign up at the website for announcements. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, which is youtube.com Hubble Space Telescope. Um, you'll get new videos and notices and reminders of live events there. Um, if you have comments or questions, you can uh, please send them in to public lecture at stsei.edu. Of course, please follow us on social media. We have um, there are many STSCI and NASA social media accounts that cover very, our various missions that we work with, um, including Hubble, Webb, Roman, and of course our Space Telescope Science Institute accounts. Um, I've listed them there, and you can so you can find them. Um, I won't keep this slide up for too long, but if you don't jot them down here and you want to look back, um, by all means go back to this um, recording, and you can find our accounts, or you can search for them on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Okay, so this is the part of the presentation where Frank would usually do a news from the universe, and I'm going to sort of put that on its head a little bit. I'm going to do news from the Earth, and what I mean by that is I'm going to give you some brief updates um, before our featured presenter on uh, three big NASA missions that have had some great, uh, some great updates and events that happened over the last month. And I'll start by showing you this slide here which is um, a slide of NASA flagship missions that have come out of what's called the Decadal Study. And the Decadal Study is a study by astrophysicists in the United States that is done every 10 years that outlines the astronomy or astrophysics priorities that, that we need to explore in the next decade. And based off of those, provide recommendations for the type of mission that should launch. And these are the outcomes of those previous decadal studies um, that have been funded. Uh, so of course you see Hubble was the first in 1990 and then the Chandra X-ray Observatory and then there's Spitzer and Webb is launching in, uh, later this year and then the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. And so these, these space telescopes, you know, 
follow a planned follow these planned studies and they're they're launched for very specific reasons and very specific science goals but they're also general observatories and they study um, astrophysics broadly in very specific wavelength ranges and with very specific instruments and capabilities. But what I want to do today is I want to give updates on three of these, um, Hubble, Webb, and Roman. So we'll start with Hubble. So Hubble, good news, it's back to science. So if you attended last month, Frank gave an update on some problems that uh, that Hubble had. It entered a safe mode on June 13th. Um, and what happened on June 13th was that Hubble's payload computer halted and the payload computer controls and coordinates the observatory's onboard science instruments. There's multiple science instruments on Hubble and the payload, the, the payload, the payload computer halted and uh, the main computer failed to receive a signal from the payload computer. And the, that all resides in what's this complicated um, thing called the science instrument command and data handling unit which is a very interesting um, acronym there, but it, that automatically placed Hubble science instruments into a safe mode to protect them. And then from that, um, what happened was many engineers and scientists from many places, including Goddard and the Space Telescope Science Institute got together to study this event and to try to understand what was causing it and what happened. Um, you can see on the right at the top, a picture of the science instrument command and data handling unit. Of which, um, of which the uh, payload computer is part of. And in the middle there, you see um, various folks at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center working to resolve this issue. Um, and on July 14th, NASA identified a possible cause. The, inter the information gathered after a series of multi-day tests led the Hubble team to determine that the possible cause of the problem was in what's called the power control unit, which resides on that same unit, the, which resides on the Science Instrument Command and Data Handling Unit. And based off of their tests, um, the, the fix was to switch to backup hardware. And so on July 15th, they switched to a backup power control unit, backup um, Science Instrument Command and Data Handling Unit. Um, and then that was successful. And starting July 17th, science observations restarted. And the first science observation, some of the first science observations that were done you can see in the lower right there, the, the black and white um, images there, but you can see some interesting images of galaxies from a program led by Julianne Dale Canton at the University of Washington. So that let us know that things were, were back in business and things were working properly. Of course, this isn't the end of the story. Um, this was a long, roughly month long hiatus on science, um, but the, the teams are still going to be, you know, exploring further the cause and, and, and what they can do um, going forward, um, but everything's working now on the on the backup system, and science is back in or Hubble science is back in business. So that's some good news from Hubble. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope is continuing to prepare for launch, so testing progress continues. There are three big things that's happened in the last month or so. One, the deployable tower assembly testing has been completed. The tower was fully extended for the last time, just it was, as it will do in space, and testing teams then lowered the tower and locked it into place to prepare for launch. Now, from this top right image here, it might be hard to see, but the, the deployable tower assembly unit, uh, assembly unit here is essentially the piece that connects the main mirror to the rest of the structure down here that includes the sun shield. And so after launch, Right, everything is going to unfold, and the main mirror is actually going to lift away from the rest of that structure. Going to lift up so that it there's a separation between the mirror and the rest of that structure, so it can passively cool and get cold in space. So that all worked. That all worked well. Um, the aft optic subsystem was cover was removed. Um, basically, if you're going to take images of space, it's good to remove. Uh, you know, like on your camera, remove your lens cover. That's basically equivalent to what this was. They removed the cover. Uh, the, the web so-called lens cap has been removed in preparation for launch. Um, so that's great news. And then the unitized pallet structure um, was stowed for launch. Um, so engineers folded the pallets in preparation for launch. Um, and the unitized pallet structure are part of Webb's complex folding mechanism. So if you look in the bottom right corner, you'll notice that um, there's sort of that that part that's kind of coming up in the lower right, kind of lifting up. And you'll notice there's like that hatch or that 
that structure that's underneath the folded up sun shield. Um, that is the unitized pallet structure and it, it secures the sun shield and it secures that part of the telescope so it can fold up safely and be safe during launch and then deploy once it's in space. Um, the Space Telescope Science Institute continues launch preparations. So STSCI is the Science and Missions op Mission Operations Center for the Webb Space Telescope. A uh, ground segment system has been tested and finalized and VIPs and media will be on site at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland for launch. Okay, so good things are happening for Webb. It's, it's a mission that's preparing for launch. Now the, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is a mission that is a, a few years out. It's, in the, it's uh, being designed and the engineering is happening. Um, in the last month, it passed a key design milestone. So um, on July 23rd, uh, 2021, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope successfully completed the critical design review of the mission's ground systems. So the ground systems are spread over multiple institutions, including the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, and um, Caltech IPAC in Pasadena, California. And the ground systems are basically the, the systems that are responsible for collecting the science data from Roman, storing them, and so on. The Space Telescope Science Institute is the Science Operations Center for the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Um, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center is the Mission Operations Center. And Caltech IPAC in Pasadena, California is the Science Support Center. So we all work together to make sure that um, the data is um, cared for once it comes back to, to Earth after Roman starts doing science in the mid 2020s. So the passing of the critical design review means that, that the plan for science operations provides all the necessary data processing and archiving capabilities. And that means that now the mission can proceed to the next phase, which is building and testing the newly designed systems that will enable planning and scheduling of Roman observations and managing the resulting data. And that is quite a feat. There's a lot of data that we expect from the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Uh, so the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is a telescope that's basically the size of the Hubble Space Telescope. It has similar image um, resolution, image quality, but it has well over 100 times the field of view um, of Hubble. So we're going to get a lot of data. It's a survey style mission. So you can see in the bottom right, the amount of data we're expecting from the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Um, over 30 years, we've had about 172 terabytes of data from Hubble. We're going to get, we're going to get about 20,000 terabytes in just five years from Roman. So there's a lot of work to be done to prepare um, ground systems, archives, and so on to store the data and make the data available um, for everyone to use. Okay, so I just some, some good news on these big missions and there's a lot of great science that are gonna come from, from Hubble, Webb, and, and Roman. Um, and I just wanna make the point before I introduce tonight's speaker that uh, none of these, missions really replace the other missions, right? So there's no, there's no, um, I would never use a, I would never use a term of like Hubble 2.0 or anything like that because these missions are complementary to Hubble. So they all have special things that they do and unique things that they do. Hubble will continue to be our ultraviolet eye on the sky. None of these other telescopes can look at ultraviolet um, and certainly not, no other space telescope can look at ultraviolet and the capability that Hubble can. Webb is going to be an amazing uh, um, eye on the sky for infrared science and spectroscopy. And again, Roman is going to do infrared, but it's going to have a larger survey. So it's going to, um, it's going to say, what we often say is, is Webb will see deeper. Webb has a bigger mirror, more sensitive to infrared, and Roman will see wider. It's going to see more of the sky and Hubble-like quality. So I hope you're all excited about the, the these new missions that are coming up and and you know we hope for many more years of Hubble and that they can work together. And with that, I am going to introduce uh, tonight's featured speaker, Dr. Isabel Rubelito um, from the Space Telescope Science Institute, who will um, talk to us on the importance of small objects exocomets. And I am actually going to stop um, sharing my slides and I will introduce her, um, but I want to give her a chance to put up her title slide. So I am going to stop sharing and I will introduce her. 
uh, as I, as as I do that. So, all right. So as Isabel brings up her slides, um, so let me introduce her. So. Isabel obtained her uh, physics degree at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain with a bachelor thesis focused on the nuclear processes of novae events. And after that, she obtained her master's degree in astrophysics from the University of La Laguna in Tenerife, Spain with a master thesis focused on the study of Kepler light curves and variations in the brightnesses of exoplanets. Um, she spent one year at the European Space Agency Center in Madrid, working with Dr. Bruno Marin and Dr. Alvaro Ribas in transition disks. Transition disks are where we believe planet formation takes place. And that led Isabel to start a PhD also in Madrid focused on the gaseous component of disks around main sequence adult stars, and particularly the presence in, of exocomets in these environments. Isabel did her PhD under the supervision of Dr. Eva Villaver and Dr. Benjamin Montesinos. Um, she is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Space Telescope Science Institute, working with Dr. Marshall Perrin and Dr. Christine Chen. And she is currently studying the disk around the famous star Beta Pic and follow, and follow up as well as studies in exocomets around main sequence stars and its relevance in the architecture and composition of planetary systems. So in addition to her fantastic research that she'll tell you about today, uh, Isabel is also a member of the Women in Astronomy Committee of the Spanish Astronomical, Astronomical Society and has participated in multiple outreach activities, both with students of all ages and gender focused outreach. Um, and she also used to play uh, football or as we say in the, in the United States, uh, soccer. Uh, she played that in Spain while she was in high school and while studying for a physics degree. And she also paints and plays guitar in her spare time. So Isabel, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Brendan. Can you hear me well and see my slides and everything? Yep. Okay, uh, thank you for a very nice presentation and, and introduction. Um, indeed, all these space missions are, are incredibly exciting. We're looking for one so much for web this year. Um, and I'm gonna talk today about uh, exocomets, which is uh, basically my PhD work, um, but I'm gonna try to put the focus on why these objects are important and not only uh, the scientific work that I did, which I'm also gonna talk about. Um, so the first thing I would like to mention is how we are biased towards ignoring this type of small bodies because it is so exciting to think about um, finding life in a planet or finding a planet that can host life outside the solar system uh, where, I don't know, we could find animals or aliens that are green uh, or gray with huge eyes. But uh, planetary systems are not just the star and the planets. Actually, um, they look something more similar to this. Um, we do have a star, we do have planets, but we do have a lot of other components in the systems. Uh, there is asteroids, there is comets. Some planets might have moons, just like it happens in our solar system. And there is also um, less, um, a, a smaller fraction of the mass contained in dust in the system. Uh, you can see some here, um, and also gas means very small amounts. Um, but yeah, planetary systems are very complex. And how do we get here? Uh, so it all starts when a star collapses um, from a huge cloud, which is tens of thousands of astronomical units um, in size, uh, just uh, astronomical units for those who might be uh, not familiar with the term is the distance between the earth and the sun. So it's, it's a large distance. So these things are huge. Um, and they're just like gas clouds that are floating in the interstellar space. And when they collapse, um, they start to uh, become more dense. Uh, all the mass is starting to um, uh, uh, locate in the center of the cloud. Um, and that eventually forms a star, but not all of the material is in the star. So if you follow this very nice diagram, you see that the cloud, um, it's shrinking uh, as it collapses. Um, and there are like some zones with higher density that is what's gonna um, uh, form the star. But there is also some material that it's located in the disk that at this point is like hundreds or less than astronomical units. Um, so it's, it's very small compared to the original cloud, but it's more or less the same uh, material. Um, and that material that it's not in the star, it's what's gonna form eventually the planets. Um, 
just so you know, our solar system, uh, depending on how you measure it and what components you take into account, but it's around like 50, definitely less than 100 astronomical units, apart from like the Oort cloud that it's further up. So this is a very complex and long process and the outcomes of that process does not only depend on the material of the original cloud, but also on how it collapses um, and how the dynamics um, behave in the process of planet formation. And we believe something, uh, the, the, we believe that what's happening is something like this, um, where we start off, uh, imagine that we already have the star, I'm not gonna go into how stars form, that's uh, also another story. Um, we already have the star, but it, the system is still very immature. So the disk that it's around the star is huge. It's very flared. That means that the scale height is huge. Um, and there is a lot of material in there, but most of it is gas. And this is what we call a protoplanetary disk because we don't have planets yet, but we will have them. Um, and so in that protoplanetary disk, there's mainly two things happening. Uh, one that the star is accreting some of its material because it's still growing, but it's also radiating an enormous amount of very energetic photons. Um, and those photons interact with the material in the disk, with the gas in the disk and blow it away. So some material of the disk is being lost to the interstellar medium and some material of the disk is being accreted onto the star. Um, as this process goes on, what happens is that they start to settle, the, the scale height decreases, we start to have a lot of dust, pebbles, the material starts accreting into solids, um, the temperature is also lower, and um, as the process goes on, it might even clear a small um, gap between the star and the disk, uh, as you see here in this part. Um, there is still photoevaporation processes, but the solids are growing. We might have planetesimals, the first protoplanetesimals, a lot of dust, and eventually um, all the material settles. It's uh, in a disk with um, not um, very large scale height. Um, and this is what we call a debris disk. And this is basically the last stage of the process of planet formation. But in this stage, we still have a lot of things going on. The disk is full of dust. Um, it's supposed to be depleted of gas. All the gas has been either accreted onto the star or lost to interstellar medium or aggregated uh, into solids. So we basically have dust um, and we have planetesimals or maybe even planets. And those bodies are still interacting uh, in between them. This is not a completely stable uh, system. So there is a lot of things going on here. But what we think this looks like, this kind of systems looks like, it's more or less like this. Um, so we would have the star and we would have um, a range of bodies and material uh, located along the disk. And we know that the material in the disk is at different temperatures because it's at different distances from the star. So it kind of makes sense that what's closer to the star, it's hotter than when that the material that is further out. So uh, if we look at the dust that is very, very close to the star, it's really, really hot. But if we look at the dust that is very, very far from the star, it's really, really cold. We're talking about thousands of Kelvin of difference, maybe 1,000 or 2,000 Kelvin difference between one, um, so on and the other. And in between we have the planets. Um, and we also have the belts that could be formed in our, in our system. And this is um, again, 100 astronomical units. Uh, the disk halo might stand uh, further than that. We know that there are disks that are bigger, way bigger than this. Um, but this is just like a model of, of what we think it's going on and what we think it looks like. And of course, depending on what zone of the system we want to see, we actually try to look at different wavelengths. So at different, let's say with different eyes, um, the, the material that it's really close to the star usually emits around two microns of wavelength. So there um, it's still very bright uh, in the near infrared. We, don't, we would not be able to see it uh, radiating thermically with our eyes because we only see in the visible range and this is already the infrared. Um, but if we want to observe the one that it's uh, in the outer regions, we have to go to 60 microns, which is a completely different wavelength and we would need um, a completely uh, different 
instrument, let's say, to actually uh, see that compared to what we have closer to the star. So this is fairly difficult to study um, altogether. We usually go by chunks. Um, but this uh, might also seem familiar to some of you. Uh, it doesn't look weird, right? Where if we are interested in the solar system, this kind of looks like it. Um, and that's because our solar system, uh, it's like the first model of how planets formed. It's the first outcome of uh, planet formation that we knew um, and until not so long ago, the only one. Um, so this is, the solar system is what we use to, um, what we use for uh, determining the planet formation theories. Uh, so as you can see, like in the previous um, diagram, we have here the solar system with uh, the terrestrial zone, with all the planets, the terrestrial planets um, inside of the asteroid belt, the sun is here. Um, we have a large chunk of asteroids uh, between Mars and Jupiter, um, which is the asteroid belt. And if we look further out here, you can see that at Jupiter, it's Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and the dwarf planets, Pluto and Sedna. And we also have what's called the Kuiper belt, which is um, also a belt of asteroids and also small bodies, but um, with a higher content in ice, just because it is further from the sun. So it can have materials that at high temperatures are gaseous um, in the form of solids. Um, and yeah, so this is very similar to, to the diagram that I was showing before. You see um, the terrestrial zone would be here, the asteroidal zone would be this, and this would be the Kuiper belt um, here. So this is um, the, like the model of what we think a planetary system kind of look like, looks like. We know um, after many, many studies and after the discovery of 4,000 exoplanets that this is not like this all the time. Uh, we can have the giant planets very close to the star. We can have only small planets, um, depending on the star that we're looking at. We believe that, that that might be related on the mass of the star, the spectral type, but we really don't know. We're still trying to figure out um, what's going on and if there is a correlation on uh, between uh, the, the architecture of the planetary system and the, and the type of star that it's, it surrounds it. Um, and so going back to the solar system, we are actually really lucky um, the moment we're living because we have reached now the point in science where we can actually go um, near these objects that are around uh, the earth and the terrestrial planets. Um, and we have been even further on um, and just look at them, look how the asteroids in the asteroid belt or the comets look like. Um, and I really love this image. Um, of Comet 67B. This is, uh, uh, up, so, uh, um, up until now I showed like pictures or diagrams, but this is a, a real image. This is um, how the comet looks like, and it's impressive. Uh, you can see it has a really weird shape. Um, it was usually called um, a duck because it has like a body and head. Um, I, I was at ESA at the moment, um, the Rosetta mission, um, reach 67P. So um, this is kind of like um, a special object for me. Um, and you can also see there is a, a lot of material evaporating from the surface because this object used to be um, really, really far away from the sun. So it has a lot of ice. And the moment it started uh, to come to the inner regions closer to the sun, it started evaporating material. And that allowed to investigate uh, the composition and also the dynamics of how a comet moves, let's say, uh, around the solar system. So thanks to um, the mission, the space missions we have now, we can do this sort of stuff. Um, and moreover, we actually landed on this comet. Um, I think it's the only comet we have landed on. Um, unfortunately, the lander did not fall properly. So it was kind of upside down. So some of the experiments they wanted to do uh, were not possible. Some of some others uh, were possible to do. Um, it also was unlucky that it fell on a shaded area, and it needed the the sun for powering. It had some solar panels, so yeah, it lasted way less than we expected. Um, and and we could there was some science that could not be done, but still, it, it was a great mission. And it was really important, and we have really really great data from Comet 67P. 
Um, but it, this is not the only body in the solar system that uh, we as humans have visited ourselves or with robots. Uh, there's actually a bunch of them. Um, Earth, of course, we're all here, right? A couple of astronauts um, orbiting. Um, the moon, we have been to the moon a couple of times. Um, and the rest of the bodies here, we have actually not been as, like a human being has not been in there, but we have sent robots or um, space missions that landed on them that were in those surfaces. So um, this is Comet 67P, that's the one that I, I was mentioning. Um, this is Asteroid Tokawa. I think this was the first, the first small body that uh, we put a lander on. I believe it was 2005. Um, so yeah, we, we have been studying um, the small bodies in the solar system very carefully for uh, some years now. Uh, and I think this is the last one, the asteroid uh, Ryugu um, that was visited by Hayabusa two, two years ago, 2019. Um, and of course there's like Mars, Venus um, and Titan, uh, one of the moons in the solar system that we have visited uh, that it's very important for um, for astrobiology research because it has um, a cycle of methane, I think. Um, so yeah, we have visited the surface of many bodies in the solar system. Um, and some of these bodies, um, like the moon, are really, really important for the presence of life on Earth. Um, this might not seem really obvious, but there are some effects that the moon causes on the Earth that we all know about. Like for example, the tides. Um, we are very um, familiar with tides. We know that the gravitational effect that the moon um, causes on the earth generates tides um, and that it's a thing that happens and that allows um, the life in the oceans. Uh, maybe not that allows, but that uh, influences the life in the oceans. But there is one thing that it's maybe more important that the moon does is that it stabilizes the axis of the Earth. The Earth is not um, completely, so the axis of the Earth is not completely perpendicular to the plane of uh, the orbit of the Earth. It's tilted 22 degrees and that's what causes seasons. So that it's allowed by the moon. If it were not for the moon, we would not have seasons. And probably um, the axis of the Earth would um, just uh, move around like crazy and we would have crazy weather. We're already doing that, I know, but that's a different thing. At least uh, the moon is not messing up with our weather, it's taking care of us. So yeah, thanks moon. Um, so moon is really important for life on Earth. So when looking um, outside to other planets, maybe we should consider how effects uh, moons could have on other planets. Um, but not only the moon has influence on life on Earth. Um, we're not so sure about this, but we think comets and asteroids are also fundamental for uh, life on Earth. Um, one of the mechanisms that uh, are used to explain the presence of water on Earth, because if we just consider the moment um, of Earth's formation, it would not have been possible to have the huge amount of water we have now in oceans, river, um, in the Arctic, um, in, in the form of ice, it would have just evaporated. Um, so the water must have come from somewhere else. Uh, one of the theories is that it actually came uh, either in carbonaceous chondrites that are uh, a type of asteroids or in main belt comets. Um, so those bodies do have a lot of water ice because they were formed uh, way further from the sun than Earth was formed. So just by dynamical interactions in between the, the solar system, um, these bodies could have collided with Earth um, and just dropped an insane amount of uh, material, including water. Um, and we have some meteorites of carbon chondrites that apparently um, indicate that the type of water that is found in these meteorites would be compatible with what's found on Earth. But this is just a um, hypothesis. Uh, obviously, it's really hard to prove something like this. Um, for example, 67P, the comet that I was talking about before, actually showed a different type of water. Uh, regarding the isotope level than the water that is found on Earth. So that kind of ruled out the theory that it was comets, but then other type of comets were found that actually have much more water and have the same 
um, isotopes ratio than the water on Earth. So this is sort of a coming and going, but it's um, kind of very established that comets and asteroids had something to do with the amount of water we have. Um, there is also some theories that are um, obviously very hard to prove uh, that life itself came from outer space um, in a comet that just collided on Earth and left the basic amino acids or even maybe proteins um, to, needed to form life. Um, so there is a um, the theory that it could have come even from the intergalactic space, just not from the solar system. And there's also obviously claims that it could have come from Mars. We just, we just don't know. But it's something that it's out there. And that is, it's something that uh, we think of and we consider when trying to explain uh, the characteristics of the Earth and life on Earth. So obviously these bodies are really, really important, like moons, asteroids, comets, are really, really important when considering habitability and when considering the presence of life in other planets. So uh, how do we find these bodies outside our solar system? Uh, where are these bodies? So um, they are really difficult to find. It is really difficult to find planets. And up until a uh, couple of years ago, 10 years ago, we barely knew any planets. Uh, now we know like 4,000, more than 4,000 of them. But um, it, it was not so common 10 years ago. So it's, it, it's hard to find planets and it's really, really hard to find small bodies because they're way smaller than planets. Uh, we do have some workarounds. Um, so I'm gonna start with moons. Um, this is kind of controversial. Um, no moons to this day have been found around planets outside the solar system. There was a claim for one, uh, but the, just the same authors that um, published evidence for a, for a next moon um, retracted it. They said that um, it was probably an error with the data, that um, it's not that it's not there, just that it's not so clear that it's there. So we have no evidence at all uh, about exomoons. Um, and there's a couple of techniques to look for them. Um, the one that I think it's more easy to understand, it's uh, the one uh, of the transits. So we basically have the light of the star um, constant. Let's say the, light, the star does not vary. Even though if there is variations, we can also account for them, we can model them. And as the, tra the planet transits, um, the, the light of the star drops a little bit. It looks like a lot here, but it's actually just a little bit. So we have to be very precise. Um, and when the planet passes, um, we go back to the normal amount of light of the star, but then the moon passes and the moon creates another even smaller transit. Um, so this would be one way to find them to actually look for these double transits. Uh, but this is really, really difficult to do. Uh, and then is, there is some other uh, techniques also based on, on the variations on the light of the star, uh, but they're way more complicated and I didn't want to get uh, into that too much. So let's move on um, to the next small bodies, which are asteroids. Um, so asteroids are already found in debris disks. This is the first stage of planet formation where we can try to find them. Um, but they're small and they're dark. They don't write or shine or anything. So we actually have a hard time trying to find them. But we, what we can do is try to find um, an indirect uh, outcome of asteroids, which is dust. So dust is actually found also in the solar system um, and in many, many planetary systems because when asteroids collide, um, they break, they break down and they, um, release a large amount of dust that it's found around the, <clears throat> sorry, around the terrestrial planets or in the asteroid belt, in the Kuiper belt. And we can see that um, when looking at the light of the star in different wavelengths, so uh, with different uh, light with different energy, um, I will try to explain this a bit later. Um, we can see that there is not always the same amount of light depending on the energy of the light. Let's say this is more blue and this is more red. Um, so we know, for example, our sun brights, uh, shines a lot in the green color, um, but not so much on the blue and not so much on the red. Um, so this is depending on the temperature of the star mostly. Um, but then uh, we have found 
that some stars do not bright, do, do not shine or do not emit the light that we expect them to emit, uh, but they do emit more. Um, for example, when we reach the infrared region, <clears throat> sorry, when we reach the infrared region, there are stars that are way, way brighter than we would expect. So this is how we expect the, the light of the star, and this is what we actually see. So what is happening here? So what is happening here is that a lot of material along the, the disk, it's absorbing the light of the star and re-emitting it in a different wavelength. Um, so dust lags a lot um, to emit in infrared wavelengths. And so that's why if there is a lot of dust, there is a lot of material that it's emitting in this infrared wavelength that light that it has just absorbed from the star. So we have this huge bump um, in the spectral of the star, in, sorry, in the light of the star, that it's not actually coming from the star, it's just coming from the dust. Um, and the asteroid belt also can emit some light, uh, but because it is closer to the star, it is hotter, it is more energetic, it's um, completely different wavelength. And it's really hard to see um, compared to the to the light of the star. So yeah, this is this is the way we have to to detect asteroids just by a, the outcome of their collisions, the dust. Um, and we do know a lot of um, a lot of systems that have a lot of dust, and therefore they probably have a lot of asteroids or planetesimals in them. Um, and these are like in the Im images in the infrared, uh, you can see they're very very bright. Um, because dust really likes to emit in the infrared. Um, and the star here, we cannot see it. It's, it's also really bright, but we cannot see it because it's obscured with this um, physical uh, dot that it's, it's actually a thing that we put on telescopes to, to block the light of the star and it's called a coronagraph. Um, so yeah, we, we can see the outcome of, of the presence of asteroids. Um, there is a type of asteroids though that some people have tried to look for that are called the Trojan asteroids. Um, in our solar system, the most massive planet is Jupiter and it has a special effect. It, it's, it's, gra its gravity has special effects on, on the asteroids that are around them. Um, what it tends to do is to um, attract asteroids to share the orbit. So they, they rotate around the sun in the same orbit as Jupiter does, but in these special points, um, there are a specific distance from the sun as well. So it's a combination of the gravity of Jupiter and the sun. Um, and so it's, it's like they're following Jupiter along its orbit or like protecting it or something. Um, so this is what we call um, the, the Trojan asteroids that are located uh, normally in these Lagrangian points, which are just like um, points where the gravity and the sun of the, in the case of the solar system, the sun and the, the planet are combined. Um, and we do think this happens in other planetary systems. Of course, like it's, it's a physical thing. It's a mathematical thing, it happens. Um, so there is people that are trying to find these asteroids so far that I know they have not found evidence of it yet, but it's a really cool project if you wanna check it out. It's called the Troy Project because the Trojans. Um, so yeah, really interesting. Uh, let's hope to see if they find anything in the near future. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna go to my favorite ones, which are the comets. Um, they are just my favorite ones because I spent so much time studying them that I feel like I have a bit more knowledge, so I like them so much. Uh, but to talk about comets, I'm gonna make a quick uh, parenthesis here and talk about wavelength, which is something that I've been commenting about on the talk, but um, just uh, hold with me. Um, so the light, if you like rock music from the 70s, you know the light, um, when it uh, passes through a prism, uh, it separates into a rainbow. Um, if you like rainbows, you probably also know this. Uh, but uh, if we uh, put it through a very, very fine prism, we can actually see a lot of features in that rainbow. If we do it with the light of the sun, we get something like this. Uh, we do get a rainbow, but in the rainbow, there's these vertical lines that um, are marking uh, very specific characteristics of the sun. It's like the fingerprints. It's something that's found in the sun that would not be found in any other star. Um, so it kind of helps us uh, study it very well. And what is causing these fingerprints, these, these features, 
is basically the material in the photosphere of the sun. So the sun produces light and that light um, goes through the whole solar system, this one astronomical unit until it reaches the earth. And that light, um, it, it's also going through the photosphere of the sun. There is material surrounding the sun um, that that light transverses. And that material um, is absorbing the light emitted from the sun. Um, and if you know a little bit about atomic physics or molecular physics, you will know that each atom and each molecule have their very specific um, light that they like to absorb. And that's what creates a very specific line. So for example, um, I think these are the sodium ones. So sodium really, really likes uh, that particularly type of yellow. So it will absorb it and it will create this feature. So we try to not only take this into account, but also take into account how much the sun brights in each different color, um, we can find something like this, um, which I think it's a, a very cool uh, plot. So these, that it's um, more transparent in the background, it's actually what the sun emits. Um, and you see it emits a lot here. This is the visible light that we can see. Um, and these small features that you have seen before are um, these dents, are, are the ones causing these dents. And the more resolution we have, the more dense we can see and the more elements we can identify. Um, for example, here you can see this is the light that it's emitted by the sun, but this is only the light that reaches us. And that's because this light is also passing through another atmosphere, our own atmosphere. Um, and these huge chunks here, um, it's our atmosphere absorbing all the infrared light and this is absorbed by the water in our atmosphere. So we basically cannot see, um, cannot try to look for water from the earth because uh, the light that would be um, absorbed by water in other planetary systems, in other planets, it's already absorbed by our planet. So it's really difficult to see. And here it's a very important part also because uh, our atmosphere is absorbing all of this light, which is, very energetic and it can, can cause cancer. And this is why we wear um, a sunscreen in the summer or if we're gonna be in the sun for a long time. Um, so yeah, thank you atmosphere. So um, going back to comets, uh, if we um, zoom in and we have a very high resolution in this region, in the visible region, um, we can see all of these features, all of these tiny, tiny features um, we can see them located in here. And I'm gonna zoom in in a region like here, more or less. And this is one of those features. This is not for the sun. This is for the star Beta Pictoris. And this is a feature, this is a zoom in in one of the features. Um, and this one is caused by calcium. Um, and if you pay attention to it, it's very obvious that there is not only that feature, but this feature so what is this? This is caused by the calcium in the photosphere of this star, of Beta Pictoris. So these must be caused by the calcium located somewhere else. And we believe, we're pretty sure, uh, that this calcium, um, it's actually located in the circumstellar medium of the star. So it's very close to the star. It's, it's in the disk. Um, and then um, other thing you can see in this image is that uh, depending on the date, there is also these weird features around here um, that must be calcium somewhere else. Uh, this is always in the gaseous form, by the way. Um, so the explanation for this, first, please note, this is 1987. Um, I was not born by then. Um, the explanation for this was this, given uh, 10 years later, um, which is basically, this is a comet. Um, we have a star here and we are looking from here. And if a comet passes in front of the star um, with his huge tail of gas that it's evaporating because it's really close to the star, it will create one of these features uh, in the calcium line, which is the one that I'm showing here. So every time a comet passes by, it generates one of these. So these things that are seen here are comets around other star, a star different than the sun, they're exocomets. Um, Again, this was 1987. It was crazy to say this was um, 
an exocomet because we didn't even have detected the first comet, oh, sorry, the first planet by then. We didn't have exoplanets. How could this be exocomets? So they had to call them falling evaporating bodies, uh, not to upset the community. But uh, comets in the solar system have two different phases, uh, a gaseous one and a dusty one that sometimes we can distinguish, sometimes we can't. And these that I have just showed you is the gaseous phase. So what happens with the dusty phase? Well, what, what happens is that we can also see it, but um, the first time we detected an exocomet, it was this. Uh, this was actually reported in 2016, but the paper did not come out until 2018. Um, and this was done with Kepler data, with a space telescope Kepler, which was a mission that took photometric points. So it measured the light coming from the star um, at different times. And you could see how it drops here uh, in a very weird shark fin shape. Um, and these are comets. Uh, and the explanation for this weird shape is just this one. So comets have a very hard solid nucleus um, that it's basically made of rock and ice. And then they have a huge tail that has less and less material the further uh, you are from the comet. So what we have is um, an ingress. So when the comet starts passing in front of the star, that looks like a solid body. So it looks like the transit of a planet. And then as the comet passes by, we have less and less material because the tail fades away. So it, it has this kind of exponential decay, which I think is really cool. Um, so we do detect comets in gas, and we do detect comets in, um, in photometry, the, the dust part, um, but we only know a handful of stars that actually have comets. And um, this is a very nice uh, plot from, uh, sorry, table from paper that came out this year. And they have these four stars where they say, okay, we know these are comets. We have proof in different wavelengths or with different methods. And we know these have comets, but we think um, some of these also have comets. We're just not sure yet because we, come, we have only seen like a couple of them. And these variations are really, really small because comets are very small. Um, so these are, all of these stars are still being studied to check if they're comets or not. Um, and this is uh, what we know about the characteristics of the stars that have comets. Um, basically, what we see here is that um, the stars that have comets are rotating really fast. This is the rotational velocity of the star. Um, the ones with comets are the yellow ones. Um, and we also see that they have a particular color that is correspondent with the stars that are quite hot. Um, these stars are called A-type stars. Um, they're not the hottest ones, uh, but they're definitely hotter and larger than the sun. And we also see that, uh, again, the variable absorptions are the exocomets, um, the exocomet candidate stars. Th there is no trend with age. Uh, initially, we would expect to have a lot of comets in stars that are very young because they are really dynamically active. The, the system is still trying to settle down. So there's a lot of interactions and so on. But we actually find it in stars that are fairly old. So, so yeah, we, cannot, we, we do not have a constraint on on when do this exocomet phenomenon happen. Um, I'm gonna talk real quick about uh, Beta Pictoris, which is like the model star for exocomets, but it's a model, this model star for many, many things. So um, if you remember, it was the uh, star that I was talking about before. This is the first star where exocomets were found in 1987. Um, but it's, it's very interesting for many other things. Like it's an A-type star, as I told before, uh, which means it's hotter than the sun, it's larger than the sun. It's fairly young, it's only 23 million years old. Um, well, the sun, it's way older, it's thousands uh, of millions of years. Um, it, it has a very high rotational velocity like the stars where we have found this type of comets. Um, it's fairly close. Uh, I know 10 to the 14th mile sounds really far away, but it's only 19 parsecs away, so fairly close. Um, and it, it has a very bright disk. So the, the fraction of the light of the star compared to, sorry, to, of the dust compared to the light of the star is quite high, uh, to be honest. So it has this huge disk of material around the star, the star would be here. Um, and it, it, it's, a, it's a really cool disk because it, it has two disks. So it has the primary disk, um, that we see here, but it, it also has like a tilted secondary disc, uh, which like it's weird. And it happens that in this 
secondary disk or, or core with, with the, in this secondary disk, there is actually a planet um, that was found with imaging. So this is a system that we know so far that has a disk, that has exocomets, that has um, a planet, um, that has a tilted disk, but um, it also has a second planet that has found that was found in, in radial velocity. Um, and this is a animation of the comets we see in Beta Pictoris through several uh, nights, months, days. Um, and you see how extreme the variations are um, around this star. Um, here you see like this is the, the combination of all those variations. So there is like a preferential um, uh, velocity for these comets, but you see that there's thousands of them. Basically, every time we look into Beta Pic, we see there's a lot of comets. Um, so going back to the other exocomet stars, you see Beta Pictoris is here, um, along with a couple others that we are fairly sure they have exocomets. And then we have a bunch of them that we think they have exocomets, but um, they don't. So there is at least these two that we have found that the variations we see um, in this type of lines, like the calcium line I showed you, are not actually produced by comets. They're just produced by some other things. And the first one I'm gonna talk about, it's HR10. And this was one of the canonical exocomet stars. Like the, this was in several papers uh, saying, oh, this star has definitely exocomets. We see a lot of variations. Um, and when we studied it, we did see a lot of variations. Uh, check this out. For example, this is again the same calcium line, um, but um, we see that there is like a component here that looks like the component of the circumstellar gas uh, that it's around the star, like in the disk. And then we see some variations coming here, coming here, coming here. So yeah, it looks like it has exocomets. But we did a very thorough study uh, through many, many nights uh, and even combined it with years of observations. And what we found is that uh, this feature appears to be moving uh, further away in this case. Um, and then at some point it comes back. Um, and if you plot the two features that we can separate here, for example, we find this. Um, so the features are actually coming and going. You see, this is from uh, 30 years ago, I think, or so, 20 something. Um, so the features come and go following this. This is where we did the study, where we have a lot of data. Um, and what does this mean? Um, so it just means that this is not star with exocomets, it's two stars with two disks each that are orbiting each other in a very particular configuration. Um, and so it appears that it's only one and it has um, a, a common circumstellar disk, so just one circumstellar disk and variations that could be exocomets, but it's not. It's just, it, it just happens to be stars with very similar temperatures um, in a very particular orbit that are even really, really close. So it's really hard to tell them apart. Um, so yeah, it was just a bad coincidence that we could only rule out after years and years and years of research. And there is another one that was uh, harder to, to rule out is this one. Um, this is also very dear to me because this is like the first um, star that came out of my PhD thesis work um, published by one of my supervisors. Um, and we found, well, he found that there was a lot of variations. Um, I took some of these observations. So it's, this is like very dear to me. Um, and it does look that there are comets. It does look like there is variations in there. Uh, but after again, months, uh, a couple of years of study where we took a lot, a lot, a lot of data, we found out that this is actually not comets. It's just that there is, um, the, the star is pulsating. It's like wobbling like this um, and it's expelling some material to the, to the disk around it. And it looks like there is a variation. I mean, there is a variation in the circumstellar material to be fair, but it's not caused by comets, it's caused by the star. Um, but no fear because we do find some comets still. Um, this was one of the ones, the, the stars that we found to have comets from my PhD thesis. Uh, this is a tiny comet here. Um, and this is actually a very particular, a particularly interesting star because it has everything just like, not like Beta Victoris, but feels like Beta Victoris because it has 
um, whatever it is, that it's really, really bright. It has some excess here. Uh, if you remember, this is the light that we spec from the star, and this would be the disk. But it also has some excess here that we think comes from carbon in the disk. So there might be like a recent giant collision or something that is releasing carbon. So that's really, really exciting. It could also be causing the exocomets. Um, and, and we have even observed the disk with an image. So we know the disk is there. Um, so yeah, this is one of the targets that I'm most excited about for the future. Um, yeah, and so what's next? Um, so it's really hard to study exocomets. Um, they're very time expensive. You need to spend a lot of nights in the telescope and take a lot of data to figure out, to, to even try to catch one of these events because they're highly sporadic. You might be observing for, I don't know, a year and not catch any uh, events except for like, the pictories where it's happening every hour. Um, but for other stars, it's not that common. So it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of money overall because you have to pay someone to be there, like a student or a researcher or someone. Um, and you have to take the telescope for yourself and other people need to do research as well. So it's really, really hard to do. Um, but these exocomets leave other traces that we can actually follow um, when they evaporate because they release gas and that gas sometimes stays in the system. Uh, so what we do is try to go to antennas, to long wavelength um, observatories, like these images we're taking with ALMA and these traces, CO gas, that it's in the outer region of the system that we believed um, has, uh, has originated in secondary um, uh, processes, so collisions or evaporation of bodies. So these gas that we are seeing here um, is not a result of the planet formation process itself, but was generated afterwards um, with the release of gas from the, the small bodies in these systems. So this looks like the path to follow to, to go on studying exocomets because it's, let's say, less time expensive. We cannot study the dynamics of the comets like this, but it looks like we could at least study the presence and we could somehow study um, some more volatile materials because calcium is not like the best um, tracer for volatiles that we could be interested on, like water. Um, so, so there is a lot of, a lot of the community is trying, it's focusing now on these type of studies um, at long wavelengths of this gas that it's just further from stars, so it's called. Um, and one um, really exciting um, project we have for the future, it's to try to use James Webb uh, to study this gas. So James Webb will be launched late October, early November, or just around maybe before Christmas, we hope. We hope it depends on the Ariane uh, rockets. So let's hope everything goes well. Um, it's the next uh, NASA big telescope. It's also uh, the, the collaboration with ESA and the Canadian Space Agency. So um, it's going to be like the, success, the successor of Hubble. But as Brandon told at the beginning, no one will replace Hubble. Hubble is our ultraviolet eye in the sky, but this would be our infrared eye in the sky now that we don't have Spitzer anymore, uh, which was the previous uh, mission. I think Brandon also mentioned it. Um, and NASA, oh, sorry, and, and James Webb will do something really, really important for the study of life in other planetary systems, for this study of the chemical compositions of other planetary systems, which is access um, wavelengths that we could not do, we cannot observe from Earth. And it will do it with a really high spatial resolution and with higher um, um, spectral resolution than we had uh, until now. Um, so, so it's gonna allow us to look at this. Uh, these are some of the instruments, uh, sorry, the instruments that are on board of James Webb. So we will observe from the, from the red, from the end of the visible to quite into the mid infrared. Um, and if, we, if you remember the, the, the plot from before, it will allow us to look into these chunks of, um, of light that our atmosphere is um, absorbing and we cannot see from Earth. So we will be able to do this from space. Uh, and if you remember these chunks of light that are absorbed from our atmosphere are absorbed by water. So that means uh, James Webb will allow us to look uh, for water in those systems because our atmosphere will no longer be a problem. 
Um, and with this, um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. I thank you so much for coming and I'll be happy to take your questions. Great, thank you, Isabel. Um, there's a lot of inter there's a lot of great conversations going on in the uh, in the YouTube chat. I will just say that if you are in the YouTube chat and you you miss Frank Summers, um, feel free to write down in, in there and give him a, a wish for a happy uh, vacation. That'll be a nice surprise when he sees that. Um, and yeah, I have a lot of questions. I so my when I watched uh, your presentation, Isabel, and and we'll get to some questions in the chat. What struck me was that uh, you are doing really hard work. <laughs> this is really difficult work. Um, you know, I, I, when I did my PhD, I, I did it on, on using spectroscopy of very difficult to detect lines and things. And I thought that was hard, but this also looks very, very, very difficult. And so um, kudos to you and your team for, for taking this on. Um, I'll start with a question and then maybe Grant can let us know if there's some good questions from the, from the chat that we wanna take on. Um, uh, let me see, which one do I want to start with here? Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll start with where you ended, which you ended with with James Webb. So other than other than James Webb, um, what other big breakthroughs in in the field in your in this field, where will it come from? Are there other particular telescopes or techniques that's going to help us um, explore exocomics? Yeah, so um... Alma is doing a great job with this. Alma, it's um, uh, interferometer that it's located in Chile. Um, it's a bunch of antennas. Um, and the more antennas you use, just let's say the higher resolution you get. So it has incredible resolving power. Um, and it allows us to actually look into the systems and see how they look like. What's the structure? If there are rings, if there are gaps, uh, where is the gas located? What's the temperature of the gas? What's the composition? So. Um, a lot of people are turning uh, to this type of, of observatories uh, to do so from ground. Um, I, I mentioned ALMA, but there's BLA, APEX, there's a bunch of, of observatories that are really good to do so. Um, and I think like if people are interested, small telescopes are also going to play a part because these stars are really, really bright. Um, so you can just observe it with a small telescope, which are not so pressured in terms of of observing time, so not as many people in the community are demanding them. So, so they could also play a role in this. Great. Um, I'll do a quick follow-up before I before I turn it over. Uh, I'm curious if 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 Roman will have any any advantages here with its ability to survey large patches of the sky. I don't know if if for example, if microlensing is a technique that's helpful for finding. Um, moons, maybe not comets, but moons. Um, yeah, definitely. So there is a lot, like I'm, I'm not expert on moons. I just like them pretty much, yeah. very much. Um, um, there is a lot of proposals on the NYX that could be used to look for moons. Uh -huh. And definitely microlensing could, micro could be one. But uh, as you know, uh, microlensing is really difficult to use because mm -hmm. we depend on so many astronomical factors. Um, so it's probably not the most reliable. Like we could, we should not count on microlensing alone to find moons. We should have a backup plan. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I think there is where other uh, missions like TESS, for example, are going to provide a lot of data. They have just announced that TESS is going to improve a lot the cadence of the data that they're taking. Um, so, so yeah, I think those type of missions are going to play a role in, in detecting moons. Okay. And I, I would be a bad host if I didn't quickly explain a, a technical term I just introduced. So, um, so for the audience, uh, microlensing is a technique in which you actually use um, gravitational lensing, the mass of a um, the mass of, of the object to brighten essentially the light of a background object. So Roman will stare at lots and lots of stars as it surveys, and sometimes those stars may just brighten because a foreground planet comes between us and that star and its gravitational influence will actually redirect the light and brighten it. And so we can use that, it's called microlensing. We can use that technique to discover planets and, and um, maybe moons. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, Grant, are there any um, questions from uh, chat that we should pick up? 
Absolutely. Chat has been chat has been lively <laughs> in a good way, in a good way. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and get us started off. We've had a little back and forth conversation. Um, are you familiar, uh, Dr. Rebuido, with um, the UN, what was it, UN two, uh, two, one, 271 Bernadelli Bernstein? No. Okay. All right. No, I'm. So, I'm sorry. I'm. I'm. No. 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 Uh, by the way, Isa is fine. Um, no need for. Uh, that. Okay. I, okay. Um, I am not an expert on comets in the solar system at all. Um, it was just an important part of my research, and specifically when putting together my thesis to, uh, put it into context of what happens in the solar system. So that's why I know um something about like Carbonaceous chondrites and and. I know about 67P basically because I was at ESA when Philae was landing and there was a huge party and everybody was super excited, but in no way I, I am an expert on, on comments. It's all good. I figured I would ask just because there was a discussion going on, but it's one of the hardest things to explain about these talks is we all have such narrow fields of knowledge because there's so much of it and it intersects with so many different disciplines. It's sometimes difficult to to get that, like just because you were an expert on um, that, like exo comments or what have you, doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be able to answer questions. That yeah. So uh, moving on to the next one, um, I think this is a little bit. Here we go. How are the radial velocities determined? Is it Doppler shift of the light, or using wobble, or how is that determined? Um, okay, so I assume it's asking about the radial velocity of the comets. Um, yes. Okay, so uh, we always determine the radial velocity of the comets based on the velocity of the comets based on the radial velocity of the star, and the radial velocity of the star is usually determined uh, by Doppler shift of the of the spectral features. We know the nominal value of the wavelength of the features. So um, when we observe, those values are not usually the nominal ones, they are shifted uh, depending on the radial velocity of the star with respect to Earth, um, which we also have to account for corrections because Earth is not always in the same position. Um, so yeah, we usually determine the radial velocity of the star and that's our zero. And depending how fast the comet is moving like towards blue or red, um, and then we um, determine the velocity of the comet. Okay. Thank you. Um, Brandon, I'm going to search through. I'm going to turn it over for you. Another one of your questions that you have. Sure, sure. So, um, Isa, I, I saw early on that you, so you did a lot of work, amazing work going back decades to actually find out that, that, that what you were seeing were not comets, but actually the orientation of two stars. Um, and I'm just curious, maybe this is more of a, a theory question, but you know, when you have these multiple star systems, um, do we think we can still have like a robust equivalent of a Kuiper belt or an Oort cloud, a cometary system in those systems, or are they too disturbed and do they get thrown out? Do those exist? Good, good question. Um, I have no idea. Uh, this yeah. is something that we've been discussing particularly with the system because there are two big stars, uh, they're bigger than the sun. Um, roughly A-type stars are like two solar radii. Um, so the radius of, of one of these stars is double the, the radius of the sun. And there are only two astronomical units apart. Mm -hmm. um, and we know both of them have uh, circumstellar material very close to them. So they're, it mu must be interacting, right? Uh, but it's something we have not been able to prove yet. Um, we do have some smaller features that I did not comment on, um, but in the paper they are mentioned. And we think uh, that is somehow present in the interaction of the stars or somehow um, appears from the interaction of the two circumstellar mediums. But we don't know, it's, it's really hard to prove, but it would be expected that there is some, some interaction in between them. Great. Right. Grant, did you have a, another question? Yeah, yeah um, I'm looking at them right now. Sure. OK, so here's one. And I agree with your analysis of tests. I'm really excited about that mission. That was one of my favorite talks that we had. Um, but 
<clears throat> how do we find the systems for us to follow up on them? And test is one of the ways that we do so, but how is it that you initially identify um, some sort of terrestrial body like this and then follow it up with a telescope or do you start with a large, like a larger observatory? Okay, so this is a great question because it's really, really difficult to identify targets. Um, we don't know why, uh, there is no explanation yet to this, uh, why we find exocomets around eight type stars, which are stars with a particular temperature around 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 Kelvin um, with this radius that is twice the radius of the sun. Uh, we don't know why we find exocomets around them, but we kind of know that we have to bias or search towards those stars because that's where we find them. Um, even though uh, we knew that, we also tried other spectral types. Like we had a range between uh, G-type stars, which is the, the, so the, the spectral type of the sun, to uh, B-type stars. So it's, it goes O, O, B, A, F, K, G, I think. Um, so, so we had a range uh, of spectral types and we tried to look in them just for a statistics purpose to see if we found any. Uh, but we also biased our sample heavily on the fact that uh, there was already circumstellar material around those stars. So we chose a lot of disks, uh, of debris disks, so stars with debris disks. We chose a lot of stars where we knew there were previous detections of comets. We chose stars with anomalous abundances. So for example, uh, we do not expect the same amount of metals in every star, in the photosphere of every star, but we do expect the same ratios. So if for some reason a star had a weird ratio of material of metals, we would select that star to look for exocomets because we assume there's something going on in its circumstellar medium. And we also chose stars that were really young, for example, because they're starting to settle. So they have a lot of dynamical activity. Um, so yeah, the sample that I used for my thesis and the sample that is, the samples that it's usually used by people that study this type of phenomena are really, really biased towards stars with lots of dust, so very bright disks, um, and, and A-type stars. If that answers the Fascinating, question. yeah, that was yeah. A, a plus question on that one. So <laughs> uh, just, just as when... a note, uh, for my thesis, it was uh, 117 stars that we studied. Wow. And we found comets in around uh, 25. So personal follow up to that, once you have more like um, more access to it, like with further test messages or what have you, how is the how are we expanding the results rather than just judging by more like arbitrary metrics or composition? Like is is there a better method moving forward or is it just distance and proximity? You mean in terms of where to look for comets? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, my thesis work was, and, and most of the comets that I talked about are found in spectroscopy and test is a photometric mission. So it does kind of a slightly different thing. Um, we, okay. We can find comets with photometry. Kepler has proven that, and TESS has proven that. TESS has found exocomets uh, in photometry for Metapeak. Uh, which is like our model uh, star for these uh, studies. Um, so it can be done. It's just really difficult because you need a lot of data. Um, and maybe you are, I think, I don't want to say any stupid thing, but I think it was like a hundred days of observations for Beta Pictoris and they found three comets. Uh, so it's, it's really um, very time expensive. That's why, for example, TESS is a very good option because it will be observing the stars nonetheless because it's it's a survey, so it will observe a lot of them. Um, but it, yeah, it's kind of, at this point, this is still kind of random. We, we do not know where to point or where to look. I love the, the sheer two sides of astronomy. You have very dedicated, fantastic instruments that are down to like the photon and then it's like well just point it that way like the the, the, the yeah. conjunction of those two sometimes is astronomy is not very elegant uh it's yeah. Just, yeah it's so very human i love it yeah. <laughs> all right um let's see 
going down through the chat here. Uh, Brandon, feel free to take another while I look. Sure, sure. I'll take another uh, question here. Um, uh, so this is the first time I've actually heard that the first exocomet was basically detected in 1987. I mean, it was detected before. And I know you said there's some controversy about claiming that or or they they didn't necessarily call it an exocomet. I you, you phrased that, but the idea that we we may have found ex, that that there's data that exists with exocomets in them from 1987 is fascinating to me. And um, so my question is, how how much information now that we kind of know better what to look for? Do you think exists in archival data across our missions that are just sitting there to be explored? I, I cannot even start to think about it. Uh, it's something <laughs> I would really love to do, go through spectroscopic data. Now that we um, are getting so much better uh, at studying and analyzing large amounts of data with machine learning or whatever uh, new techniques we have, it, I would love to just go through archives, try collect all the high resolution spectroscopic data, do a search. Mm -hmm. um, it's really difficult for other reasons, like um, the, the data is treated in different ways and you should do an homogeneous treatment through all of them to, to compare and stuff like that. Um, but it has been done for Beta Pictoris. Uh, there was a paper in 2014 that was published in Nature uh, that is studied thousands of exocomets around Beta Pic. Um, I think there were 2000 or maybe more. Um, and they actually found some very interesting things because they had so, so many data from so, so many years. Um, mm -hmm. Like there are like two families of comets um, that are consistent with two different locations and they actually have kind of different compositions. Uh, it's kind of bold to assume that and to say that, but they, they do, we do see that they have different amounts of calcium and sodium in them. So, so there's, Two families of exocomets in Beta Peak, and the only reason we know that is because we reached the point where we had 30 years of data. Wow, wow, yeah, it, it reminds me of of some of those um, results that we've had in the last 10 years, where um, people have discovered, you know, planets, exoplanets, and old Hubble data, for example, that are in the archive. That you know, as as you said, as you were saying, as our machine learning and our techniques improve. The data is there to do a reanalysis, and you find things that you didn't see before. It's amazing. Oh, and you're muted. Right, there you go. Very much so. Yeah. Uh, so I'll get us our last question here. We have time for probably about one more, and we'll call it. Um, observations by Alma. Have they provided any data of exoplanets uh, or exocomets? Is that or exocomets? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, to look for exocomets, what we do is like examine a time series of data. So we compare, like we take one spectra, one photometric point now, and then another one like, in 15 minutes or whatever, we compare. Um, mm -hmm. That it's really expensive to do with ALMA. ALMA observations usually take a lot of time to detect gas. It's a completely different wavelength. It's a completely different instrument. Um, but what we do see from ALMA data, it's the outcome of the exocomets. We see the gas that they have released in the medium, that it's revolving around the star that was released by collisions or by evaporating comets or whatever. And, and that's what ALMA is capable to, to give to us. And it's also very important, the fact that it's volatile materials. So it's materials that evaporate at very low temperatures, unlike calcium, calcium is a metal, right? Um, it's a refractory, a metal in, in we call a metal in, in astrophysics. Uh, it's a refractory material. It needs thousands of Kelvin of temperature to evaporate. So it has to be really, really close to the star. But in contrast to that, the volatiles are very easily evaporated. So they're found at long distances from the star. And they are not only easy to find far away and, and cooler temperatures, but they're also very, very important for the development of life. Okay. All right. So awesome. Thank you very much, both of you, Brandon, yeah, for you. filling in and being our, our lovely host. And I hope you're getting a lot of rest, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Isabel, thank you so much for, uh, for coming and talking. And yeah, Brandon, I'll you let both. you finish this up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very happy. And um, 
so again, just a reminder that um, we have, we have, uh, what was it? I have to look at my presentation again um, <laughs> to see what the next dates are. I'll just remind you all real quick. So uh, September 7th, we have astrology vers uh, versus astronomy. What's the difference really? Um, and so please join us for that. And um, Frank should, should be back, but if he's not, <laughs> Then there's an issue, but I'm happy to fill in. Um, and uh, in October, how dark is space? Uh, and so, yeah, we have a couple of uh, really great public lecture series coming up. And thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Isa. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, everyone.